Thank you for sharing that. That actually is, um, it's, it's nice to see that there's a universe that, you know, a small world that you can look at that gives you that kind of comfort. Yeah. And it ends up being not such a small world. It's a large, it's a large area to explore. It's a, a very interesting world down there with a lot of life going on that we don't notice usually. Yeah, and you captured the sense of movement and um, wind, the circular diagonals, and um, you know you get the you get the sense of things moving, um, or at least a light breeze moving things. So thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, thank you for having me. Oh, pleasure. Um, Dory Miller, cocktailing with a friend. Um, so Dory's. Um, her, her work is always interesting and her explanations are always interesting. <laughs> I have to say that um, I, I loved the composition of this. I saw that lovely uh, fly, that, um, lantern fly. We're gonna see another painting after this. And when I first saw the um, image, I thought maybe it was a glass. It sort of reminded me of um, Gustin, uh, Philip Gustin, he has those, those sort of big shapes and these funny yellows and oranges and grays. And, um, and he also is sort of humorous a lot of times, um, or sometimes not so humorous, sometimes very political, but um, it just had that feeling. So I asked her to discuss this um, juxtaposition of the two images and, and what's this all about. So, Dory? Hi, uh, again, like everybody else, thanks for having me, Roberta. It's so good to be here. Um, the juxtaposition is simply that I was, uh, it was recently Negroni week and there were a lot of Zoom classes on how to make the perfect Negroni. And I was watching them while I was having a Negroni outside in my little backyard area. And these spotter lantern flies have been very um, bold and coming very close or landing. Sorry, sorry. Tell people what Negroni week is. Negroni, Tell people, people don't, I didn't know. Hold on. Negroni is. Are you leaving? Okay. Oh, wait. Keep going. Ready to keep going? Or should I wait for Roberta? I think you can tell us. It's okay. I think yeah. she knows when Negroni is now. Come on. <laughs> Maybe she's looking it up. No, I had to yell at my husband. <laughs> Making a lot of background noise. <laughs> Negroni Week is um, a cocktail called the Negroni that was started. Um, it's, it's because of the Campari that is in the Negroni. And it's, it's just the perfect cocktail made of three very simple ingredients, all equal parts. And there are very many variations. It's a very beloved cocktail. And I have a mutual friend for Tina and, my, and myself introduced me to them. And it's this incredible um, combination of bitter and sweet at the same time. And it's quite an experience. And I've really enjoyed, um, oh, she's bringing them up. <laughs> yep. So um, the Campari does this promotional thing every for a, a Negroni week. And it usually is in person and you go from bar to bar to have a Negroni. And because it's it's COVID time, they instead have these Zoom uh, lessons with all these famous kind of flair bartenders showing us how to do things. So um, that was very local for me because I spent a whole week submerged in it during COVID at uh, home alone. And I recently went to the 11th Street Galleries and um, had an itch on my shoulder while I was walking around and I didn't know what it was. And then I got home and when I took my sweater off, a poor, kind of disabled spotted lantern fly who had crawled into my sweater was now on my living room floor. And I thought that was pretty local. And so <laughs> I actually, don't get mad at me. I think that they're beautiful and I didn't want to kill it. So I helped it, I put it outside on a plant and I think he survived, but uh, made me want to bring him into the, you know, cocktailing with a friend. <laughs> image was not a glass actually what was I'm sorry Roberta the, the abstract image that the uh, 
fly is sitting on was not a glass, it was a pin. Right, right. One of the swag things, so, um, and this is for Bob Moore as well. He was just asking me about this. In a way, this is appropriated in that somebody had already decided on the sections and the restrictions of making an enameled pin and how enamel, and you have to have the border of the metal line around it. And I was really intrigued by that breaking down and simplifying of such a complex image as a cocktail and liquid in a glass. So I thought, let me, let me see if I can paint that segmented the way the designer, whoever made the pin. And then I, you know, I, I appropriated that image and then I, I don't have it with me now, but I also then tried to make a version of this without all the gold and kind of make it my own even more. I enjoy your explanations and your paintings. It's just very creative and um, say imagination. I'm not worried about you for the next exhibit on unlimited boundaries, breaking boundaries. Um, Carol Tejian, as you say, so. Thank you. Should I start? Um, I think we lost Roberta for a second. Uh, yeah, why don't you go I, ahead, I'm Carol? lost without Roberta. <laughs> yeah, you can start. Uh, well, yeah. she had asked me. Um, yes, okay, thanks. All right. There so you are. Hi. This I think we're all it having a bit of a ominous so problem, so feel free to just continue. Okay, so this is seems to be an ominous scene out of a um, our film packed with all the symbolism. It seemed uh, beginning with the title "As You Save, So Shall You Prosper." It seemed like this voice coming from the heavens or something. And um, you have this bird. Is it a symbol of death? You have a bear attacking these antelope. Um, their an their antlers seem like they're reaching up, and you have this cold uncaring sun sort of looking on the whole scene like nature doesn't care. So I just was very puzzled by this um, very na puzzling narrative. So Carol, could you describe, and her, her local inspiration is going to be a surprise. <laughs> well, this is really just a still life. Um, I have like a little window sill where I have things that I like. Um, the, the, the globe is a, it's a little coin bank that I found on the street. Um, and I really like it. It's really, it's, I like old uh, maps and old globes. And this one, I, I've been trying to figure out the date by looking at what countries are, what the names of countries are. And it's, it's hard to read because it's only about this big. It's only like the size of a, a softball or smaller. Um, and it, I think that's interesting. That's always, I always find that interesting. So I'm try, I've been trying to guess, like it's definitely pre-Soviet. It's um, pre, uh, I mean, it's post, it's during the Soviet era. So it's pre, pre uh, Glasnost, Perestroika. It's, um, it goes back and there. And what about the other animals? Oh, well, the other what animals, the too, they're little toy and they're little plastic animals that I bought for another project where I had to, I actually had to make, quasi-realistic line drawings. So I needed I needed those animals in the drawings. So I I bought them. Here's here's the bear. Um, and so I bought them, but I, I kept them on the on the on the windowsill because I like them and I like to, to um, they've they've popped up in a couple of other of my drawings. Um, and the bird is a live bird, not in my studio on my window. So it's a live bird that I've been drawing. I go to the zoo and draw it. Um, he's actually very beautiful. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, he, there's sort of an ominous look to, no, to the birds, but they're, no. they're not ominous at all. They're, they're really kind of remarkable and, and gorgeous looking. Um, I didn't intend for it to look so dark, but I, I do agree with you, Roberta, that it, that it has an ominous feel. And the, the title is just from the bottom, the, the, the rim at the bottom, the base of the little coin bank says, as you say, so you prosper. Um, I, I didn't intend for it to come out this dark and um, 
but it did, and and that happens sometimes. You you, you don't well, know what's going to happen. I, I love it because it, it's it's such a puzzling narrative, and um, like I said. The surprise is, what did she use for her local inspiration? It's what artists can do using these plastic toys and coming up with this narrative. Um, you know, imagination is to be um, complimented. <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing. Sure. And looking yeah. forward to you breaking what you can do. <laughs> um, oh, I see and, a um, text about the coin bag. Yeah, this is, this is before the 70s. Um, if I were to Right to you, I would tell you the countries that I can read on there. I think some of them are from before. It, it was before Germany was divided, so it has to be um, before 1961, um, because it looks, still looks like a unified Germany, and, and but it's before the breakup of this. Anyway, blah, sorry. That's okay. That's that one, it's yeah. fascinating. Tina, I, um, so fireflies on you, the, um, number 11. We can have the image. So her piece is very striking on many, many levels. Um, <laughs> so you can't miss the main subject with those orangey red, red lighty um, wings and uh, of the movement. You have a movement with this black against um, the black diagonals, this over strike, stroke. You have the um, texture. You have um, a very strong center and a lot of diagonals. And um, I was just wondering about if, uh, you know, one of the things we learned last time is she used tar, if there was any tar in this. So can you talk about how you compose this and why you use fireflies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, I hope so. Um, uh -huh. I think we're all like the firefly, I think, or the, I'm sorry, the, um, the spy lantern fly is like the, the um, symbol for 19, for 2020, because um, it's kind of this beautiful, beautiful creature. It's really devastating to our, our plants and, and our environment, right? And it was introduced. Um, but, it, but it's beautiful, so you don't want to kill it. And so it's like this hard, it's like, they're just these like, um, huge emotional draw feelings about it right um so i have a little community garden and they've just been infesting everything and i don't want to kill them because they're beautiful but at the same time i know that they're basically locusts i mean they're beautiful locusts right so it seems appropriate for 2020 <laughs> um but i um in doing my other work i had um disposable palettes so i was just like dumping the tar and gold leaf and paint and it looked really pretty um, as a background. And I thought, well, the colors really reminded me of the vibrancy of the spotted lantern flies. Um, and then as far as the title, um, early on in the lockdown, people kept commenting about how the environment seemed to be improving and was so much better because as humans, we weren't out and about and we weren't driving and we weren't taking planes. And so the... Um, all the pollution levels that seemed to list. And in the early spring, everybody was talking about the fireflies and how they hadn't seen them locally for years. And they just seemed to have made a huge comeback. Um, so I was kind of going back and forth between these two insects. One is beloved, the other is hated. Um, kind of why, it, it, just, it just seemed like the whole, th all of 2020 wrapped up in one little bundle of a lot of contradictions. Well, um, it's interesting about two different artists taking um, two different viewpoints. I mean, well, not different viewpoints, but two ways of the Firefly making it part of their own vocabulary, their own vision. Um, a lovely piece, great use of the palette. <laughs> so um, number 12, Stephanie, earrings. Hi, Steph Stephanie, are you there? Yes, I'm here, yep. Hi. Hi. Good to see you again. Me too. So we often, we women often put on earrings without thinking about it. You know, it's just an accessory or maybe we do think about it because we're really concentrating on how we look. But, you know, you just reach and start putting it on. And 
I thought that was interesting that Stephanie used it as a um, still life subject. And it made you know, a focus on the shape, different colors. And she had, I think, two different earrings on there. Yes. And so I looked at the elements that interested me as I was looking at it. I liked how she got the light on the crystal. I also liked those chunky shadows that reminded me like Randy, whose shadows and um, the negative space as it is on a par with the subject. And it looked like her shadows are interesting and they're, they're not in background. And Um, was it intentional to leave a white background? So, Stephanie, um, you want to talk yes. about your piece, why you put the jewelry? Uh, here are the original, <laughs> the models for the, <laughs> these are the earrings. Um, honestly, it was, it was, your art it, it was during lockdown. I was just, frankly, I had taken my first watercolor class and I was running out of subject matter and I sort of I wanted to look for something colorful and something that would just be pretty to look at for an hour or two on end and I um so I grabbed pieces of jewelry set up the lights so that it would cast a big shadow and I um took a photo and then when I enlarged it I realized how much detail how much how intricate these small objects are I didn't think I ever realized that before I looked at them that closely um, so it almost became, uh, first I would draw it in pencil and then I, and then I added the watercolor. Um, it was almost meditative. I mean, I really was just getting lost in, in the little facets and things like that. So it was, it was kind of more of an escapist thing. And I think the white background was just, you know, I actually took the picture on a white dresser, but I think it was more just, as I said, I'm kind of a novice in, in painting. So it was, I hadn't really thought enough to <laughs> consider maybe adding color to the background. So that was, that was the reasoning. That was one of the questions I asked her if she had thought about putting some um, a wash in there or not, you know. But so this is a um, the first introduction, and then we'll talk more about it. But there is a Tuesday um, share Zoom session that the Classic Club sponsored. Bob Moore holds those every Tuesday um, um, the evening, and people share what they're working on and people would say, give a comment about your background and you could accept it or reject it, but it gives you, you know, some more peers that you normally have if you were taking a class. And so it might be something that you'd be interested in. Um, yeah. You know, you share as you're going along. Anyway, so thank you. I thought the piece was very, very uh, interesting and it, it's monumental, something that is just, when she held it, see there's just there's Focusing on an object it becomes important. It becomes monumental. Um, congratulations. <laughs> UFO. Hello. Hi. Oh, okay. So this day. I didn't hear what you said, Roberta. I'm sorry. Hello? I think we were lost Roberta. Okay, uh, so should I start then? Uh, yeah, yeah. Why, why not until she comes back? Okay, so briefly, um, this is silkscreen. I started silkscreening a few years ago. I'm a digital artist, but I got frustrated with the lack of physicality of printing so I started silk screening and I've been pretty frustrated lately because I haven't been able to silk screen since uh, COVID-19. Um, briefly about my technique, um, I do all my uh, original work digitally. I, a lot of people use Photoshop which I use but I also use uh, Corel Painter and I do a, a, a full digital print which I can then use to make uh, uh, my stencils. I trace and cut them, but I also do photo emulsion prints. So um, when you use Photoshop, et cetera, you can, you have layers and I don't want to get into it, but you have techniques that you can 
then do a bitmap picture and print it black and white. And uh, I used to send that out to have an acetate made, but now I do that on my own. So about, about the work itself, I, it's, I don't know, is Roberta back? So does she want to say anything first or? Uh, we don't have her back yet. Um, okay. So ironically, the, obviously this is City Hall. Um, I'm a Philly boy, born and born and raised. Uh, I grew up partially on North Broad Street, so I saw this all the time. Um, I also have worked numerous times near City Hall, but the inspiration for the work, I was in Washington, D.C. in a hotel room visiting my son. He used to live there, and there was a photo on the wall of a monument from Washington, um, a statue, and also a parkway and the Washington Monument in the background. And I looked at it and I started thinking about Philly. So I went to obviously City Hall. Originally, I was going to try to find a statue on the parkway to have in the foreground, but I decided just to get an image of City Hall. Um, and the picture was at sunset. So I tried to uh, have a sky contrasting from the black and white of the building with uh, oranges, pinks, and some purples. Most of my work is a little uh, strange or idiosyncratic, so I, I'm not apt to make just a picture of City Hall, and somehow I thought of a, a flying saucer with a yellow light and uh, looked for an image of that on the internet. And once I did that, I had to then include some people uh, in fear scurrying around so there were various layers that I did. Some of this was from stencil. Some of it was photographic. Um, is this a movie still that the images are coming from? No, I, I composed all this myself. I, you know, got, got different images from the internet and transformed them and then put them in there. So they're just- So you, so you don't know the, the origin of these people? Well, they're pretty much public domain, you know, images on the internet. Okay. And, and I assume you mean it, it's City Hall you saw every day, not the UFO. Um, I'm sorry, but, say that uh, again, please. <laughs> never mind. Um, I, I'm curious what the, uh, what the substrate is. If, if you're silk screening, what are you silk screening on? Is that fabric? No, that's, uh, that's paper. Oh, yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, so, you know, you have stencils, you have emulsion screens, you know, I, I might put multiple images on one screen or a mobile screens and it's been a real process to learn how to silk screen and I really enjoy it. It's difficult and hopefully I'll be able to get back soon. So. And how, how large is this? Um, how long have I been doing it? Uh, how large is the... Uh... Oh, it's, uh, the paper is 19 by 24. You know, the image is somewhat smaller than that. Okay. So you need some space. And yeah, I work out of the Cheltenham Arts Center, which has basically been closed. And I do my screens at BYOB Prints in Kensington, which I, I assume some people are working there, but I haven't been. So, yeah, you, you know, I can't seem to silk screen at home. I really need a studio. So I'm looking forward to this being over so I can get back to it. Okay, great image, Bates. Thank you. Yeah, Bates, I have to say I love this piece. Um, Halloween is one of my favorite holidays. So when I saw this, I got super excited, uh, even though I don't know what Halloween's going to be like this year. Um, I did notice that the the title I have is different than what I have on, on uh, the exhibition. Is that the autonomous uh, mood? Is that the correct... No, PHL UFO. Okay. That PHL, the airport abbreviation for Philly, and then the UFO. So. Okay. Yeah, I think it's correct on the website. I don't know. Oh, no, it. that that is not correct. Latonal mood. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll fix that anyway. Um, so Roberta had lined up Gloria Rolfs, uh, her community garden piece for the next show. Um, okay, I'm here. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think Roberta will be back soon. Um, okay. I don't know what she had talked to you about, but I mean, this piece is just beautiful. It, it just has this gorgeous quilt-like quality. I was kind of wondering. Oh, oh, 
Okay. I used to do quilting like 40 years ago and the conceptualization of some of my art is very influenced by that. I, I think one of the things that in, was intriguing about this is, is at first sight, it just looked like it was a abstract composition. You had three large um, horizontal columns of different widths and, horizontal, and vertical columns all broken up with triangles. But as I looked at it and studied it longer, I saw it's actually a landscape. Yeah, you figured it out. It's very literal. Look, well, but um, I thought that was really quite good. It was like a hidden landscape. Uh -huh. um, and it took me a couple of lookings before I really saw that. The, the bottom two Col the bottom two strata layers are the foreground that you have the browns and the greens of the grassy mm -hmm. area. The next one, two, three, four, one, two, three, probably three layers, you have the middle ground, which is the flowers and the grass. So you have those yellows and reds and greens. And if you look at the last column, the upper column, you have the blue sky and the sun. So I thought that that was an interesting, um, use of, uh, you know, what was apparently abstract, actually read as a landscape. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of fun to see that. And then when you were a quilt maker, it made a lot of sense. So could you describe how you went about this? I mean, did you um, do a collage first? Did you um, use tape for your shapes? How did you make it? No, I um, don't use so tape. I was inspired by the community. There's been a community garden behind my row house for about 10 years. I'm very fortunate. And, uh, you know, it's just wonderful to look out the kitchen window and see that. The way I made it, I do a rough draft just with paper and um, pencil and a ruler, draw the lines, you know, it actually as if I were making a quilt and then I would cut out the pieces for the quilt. But um, I just draw the lines and then um, can it transfer that to canvas, stretched canvas, and I do plan the basic idea, you know, I plan the colors to begin with, some of the basic colors, like, you know, earth base colors at the bottom and the sky at the top and all the different <clears throat> flowers and veggies and lavender plants and stuff and bushes and trees. But I don't, I just draw it with pencil and then I paint acrylic along those lines. So I don't drink before I paint. <laughs> I have a steady hand. And you must uh, have a steady hand. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was really interesting because we've had two different garden scenes. We had um, Betty McDonald's when we were looking at um, the mm -hmm. bird's eye view and we have an abstract view. And it just shows again how artists can be looking at sort of the same idea of gardens and the, what's up, down at their feet and have come up with a whole different interpretation of it. And that's what's so wonderful about being able to have a salon and share our different visions. So thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Um, and I have voted already, by the way. <laughs> Yes, I did too. <laughs> uh, we have another, we have another um, um, abstract landscape, Allen's um, Maniac Street. And this is a really wonderful, um, in some ways it's an H composition or a composition of uh, rectangles, but you have certainly a strong H composition in there. And really a lot about what he does and that's in here is variety and sameness because he sets up a rhythm by some colors that are the same but it's not the same patterns and so your eye moves around if you look at the blue column and then you look at that yellow gray column those diagonals match up and so you have a nice rhythm he also has a nice rhythm with his, um, what look like um, windows of an apartment buildings or cars passing by on streets whatever so you have variety and sameness. So Alan, can you direct, um, can you speak about this piece, what, why you sp um, took Maniac and um, what inspired you? Do we have Alan here? Yeah, Alan, would you mind unmuting so we can hear you? Okay. Yeah. Can you, you hear me? 
Yeah, but there's an echo. Um, yes. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on, I'll take care of the echo. <laughs> so, are you okay, okay. now? All right. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, we're still getting an echo, yeah. Ellen. Yeah, I know. Hold it just a second. It's my wife's computer. Oh, don't blame the wife. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna, should I come back to Alan after I do, we'll have, Tina, I'm going to come back to Alan. I'm going to come back to you after you, you fiddle with your computer a little. Are you okay? Yeah, we, we could come back to him. Can, can we go? Why don't we go to James Schrode? That's where our Tom mood is. Jimmy Schrode. So, Jimmy, um, do we have, is Jimmy here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, good. So this is a small piece. It's 12 by 12. Yeah. But boy, does it pack a lot of energy that's created by the strong diagonal brush strokes, by this texture. I mean, you really have the artist's presence in this piece. He has a central image that's dark that contrasts nicely with the light area on, on the right-hand side for us. And a lot of values, a lot of movement. Um, he also has this diagonal line at the top that's um, really directs your eye back down to the central um, dark figure. So I wanted him to speak about what was his inspiration. And I was also curious, the piece is 12 by 12, whether or not this was actually done 12 by 12 or if it was a cropping. So Jimmy? Yes, this is, this is a 12 by 12 canvas, 12 inches by 12 <laughs> inches, small piece. Okay. And um, I did this with a acrylic and um, I did this with paint knives. I'm sorry, Alexis chatting. Um, I did this with a uh, paint knife and brush and acrylic paint and everything. The inspiration is uh, my late partner, he had been sick for quite a while and I would go for walks along the Schuylkill Trail and up into Fairmount Park. And this was, I painted this last year around October 10th. And just the play of the color of the changing leaves and the light coming through the trees and the feeling of it just really captured me. And it was really giving me comfort all that day. So when I came home, I just started painting it. And, um, it's a, it's a very beautiful piece, and I, I paint a lot by instinct. You know, um, I'm self-taught. I'm still learning. I'm an amateur, and um, I just really paint by instinct and just go with the flow of the feelings and the color. And you don't want to lose that. I mean, capture. don't don't lose that. That, that energy of your instinct and your passion. Um, I mean, I, I saw that painting immediately and it hit my list immediately of somebody that I was gonna contact. And, um, you know, you had a very, very um, emotional reaction to a scene that was both comforting to you and also powerful. And you have that kind of energy. Don't lose it, it's so wonderful. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much. It's, um, we hope to see you next time also um, with that energy. <laughs> um, should we go back to Alan? Yeah, I think Alan is ready now. Hey, Alan, I'm sympathetic about computer issues. <laughs> okay. So Alan's piece is um, just very striking, very colorful um, and very, very 
organized, but yet it's, you have a sense of movement. So Alan, can you tell us about this, this piece? Yeah. If I can get on. <laughs> I, I should You're be. on, but we you hear sound, you. You sound great, Alan. Okay, I sound great. All yeah. right. You sound uh, great. This, uh, when I first came to, this, this is uh, a digital print. I do a lot of work on the computer. It's probably one of the last few people in my generation to work on a computer, but I find it very interesting. It allows me to draw more quickly than I probably would on paper. However, the subject is Maniunk, which is the last industrial vestige of the city of Philadelphia. My wife worked there. Uh, she was design manager for Container Corporation, my wife Elaine, and uh, it's always been sort of an enigma to me because it, it's based on a hill. It had two of the biggest cardboard box factories in the world, one on the bank of the river, of the Schuylkill, the other on an island, was Container Connolly Corporation. And there was Container Corporation of America, which was on the uh, right bank, the river. It also was uh, a big paper company around the same site. However, what I, to, what I wanted to express was the fact it was the last vestige of industry in the city of Philadelphia. And it was also a residential neighborhood. The houses are piled up on hills. It's a very close knit neighborhood. And when Container Corporation moved to Oaks, Pennsylvania, which is near Phoenixville, they offered to transport their workers to the new box factory in Oaks, and they refused. They said they would rather stay in their home neighborhood than continue working for the company. And that was, to me, it was pretty amazing how close knit a community it was. Uh, my background has always been interested in industrial subjects when, when I was young. One of my heroes was Charles Sheeler. And my career is somewhat parallel because he painted for industrial scenes of America. And I always was interested in painting or creating pictures of industrial scenes in America. He became a photo editor of Fortune magazine, which I had read as a young teenager, as a teenager. And I worked for a large pharmaceutical company in Philadelphia. So anyway, uh, I continue working this way. My compositions aren't always this simple, but I hope it does convey the idea that it's an old industrial neighborhood and it still has very nice and gentrifying houses there. Thank you. I mean, Thanks. you have both some you have simplicity and complexity. I mean, it's always hard to get things that are very simple to be powerful. Um, it's not so simple. <laughs> so I think you did a really good job. It's a very striking piece and thank you a lot. Thanks for um, having number me. Number 17 is Katie. Oh, see you next time. <laughs> Katie Lynn is just having fun. It's number 17. So, um, Katie, are you here? I don't understand why you're never on there. Never on there. You never have is, is Katie here? Tina, is Katie here? Uh, I, thought I don't know if she's a participant. Just one second. She's, she's signed in. Yeah, she's here. Um, maybe you can unmute. Hello. Hi, Katie. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Katie. How are you? Good. So, so um, I thought her title said it all. You look at the piece, you say, wow, that is fun. <laughs> and she must have had fun doing it. The piece is fun with its bouncing, falling red, blue, yellow orbs, different sizes. Um, and she has this area that seems to suggest either a sunset um, just different kinds of suggestions keep going on there. You could keep looking at this painting and have all different ideas about it. So she did this on Yepo, 
and um, I wanted her to discuss how Yuppo affects her painting and what was her inspiration. And um, Katie gave me a really very interesting explanation about how she works, both on Yuppo and through her imagination. So Katie, could you share that with us? Yes. <laughs> to me, this is very, my painting <laughs> is always very personal. Just relating my personal feeling, my mood, based on what I have observed before. And uh, I don't render anything uh, before my eye. I'm not describing representationary. So obviously because I'm an abstract painter. So even though I mentioned the theme is related to the gardening I have been doing in my balcony. And also I have been observing dramatic sunset from my balcony. So kind of two com combined and yet, but I don't like to describe directly what I saw. However, I will uh, internalize what I have seen and I'm more or less conceptual in a sense. And I always believe in mind and the body, that sort of thing. And then create something, it comes to me naturally. And because I'm an abstract painter, I don't enforce anyone to follow my idea. I, interpretations is up to the viewer. And uh, you put, I like you put, the surface I use many times with watercolors and oil paint. They are very flexible. You can wipe it clean and redo the area you don't like. And uh, so that's the way it goes. And um, as you see some circular shape forms, mm -hmm. that is my uh, recurring motif in all of my paintings here and there. I don't like the perfect shape of circle shapes, but I usually render more or less circular form and uh, some are arc, some are semi-circular, some are small, some are large. They all indicate a rhythm, move, movement and things like that. <laughs> Well, it's up to viewers' interpretation. It's open to your interpretation. You can say anything you like <laughs> according to your background, your art experience. So I'm open to your interpretation. You can say anything you like. I thought this was, um, I like, I'm sorry. What Katie was saying about abstract art and about her process. I, I enjoy hearing about your process as an abstract artist and how you are open for the viewer. And that's probably a very important aspect of a, a good painting that a viewer can keep bringing things to it. And there certainly is a lot you can say about this. I, Katie also shared another thought um, when she wrote back to me. She says, um, to me, art is never finished, never complete. One painting may express something, never all. And that's why I keep painting. So I thought that was a, just a very beautiful thought. And I thank you for sharing that with me. And I wanted to share it with others. So I look forward to seeing more I of your work. You. I, always enjoy, I always enjoy your work. Susan Gordon. I thank you for sharing. And we'll see you next month. 
Susan Nevelson, uh, Susan Nevelson, Susan Gordon beyond Nevelson. <laughs> hmm. Yes, I'm here. Um, oh, no, I wasn't talking, so I was talking to my husband again. <laughs> okay. Um, I thought that um, this was a very enigmatic um, work. It, you had these, this orb, you had these um, very striking figures, you had these framing of abstract shapes. Um, you know, I kept looking at it. This piece involves the viewer. It requires the involvement of the viewer. So um, I asked her to discuss how Nevelson inspired her. Who are these figures? What are they all doing together? What's the symbolism of that circular shape? So Susan, go for it. We have a lot to talk about. <laughs> Okay, um, just to let you know, my connectivity has been um, really bad, so I might be going in and out. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, Okay. I, I have the same problem. <laughs> okay, so this uh, was a, initially started as a digital photograph that I took at the um, Western entrance to the art museum before it was closed in, um, I guess, ninth, in 2018 or 2019. Um, on one side of the entrance was uh, Jacob Epstein's social consciousness sculpture, which are the three figures. And on the other side was um, a large abstract sculpture, um, Atmosphere and Environment 12 by Louise Nevelson. I was waiting for friends and I decided to sit behind the Nevelson sculpture and um, I had my iPhone out with me and I started looking around and I realized that if I bent down one of the orbs of the Nevelson sculpture, or her, the sculpture has lots of um, open um, rectangles and uh, circular mm. orbs throughout it. If I bend all the way down, the, one of the orbs from her sculpture uh, seemed to frame the um, social consciousness beautifully because it just really followed the lines of, of, of that other sculpture. And so I took huh. a photo of it, um, went home, um, made, it, um, made um, a digital um, negative, uh, printed it out, and then uh, did a cyanotype um, development of the photograph. Um, the cyanotype isn't blue because then I toned it in black ink. And after I finished it, um, I wanted to add more movement to the composition. So I cut out some um, lines and uh, different shapes and put metallic paper in the back. So there's a copper and also gold metallic paper in the back. And that's and that's, that's why it's called Beyond Nevelson. Uh, okay, so uh, I hadn't got her explanation, so I've been waiting for it. <laughs> okay. so thank you. I so mean, you it, no that, that's how the orb got in. Right, so by the way, you can no longer this, see, It was well worth the wait. You can no longer see this composition um, because Correct. the sculptures have been taken down, and I think they're on Penn's campus now, but they're not they're not communicating with each other anymore. Well, actually we can't see that composition because you have captured it. it is, and so it's ever, but as long as that piece is there, that's one thing about our little also things for more permanent. That actually that viewpoint is, is there in work that interesting piece. So couldn't wait to hear about that orb. <laughs> okay. Um, so Kim Scheinbaum, Summer's End in Somerville. So Kim, let's see, we don't have Kim yet. I'm here, oh, but she's I'm coming. muted. Oh. Can you hear me, Roberta? No, we can hear you. Okay. Yes. So there you are. Okay, so Kim is is the Plastic Club ambassador. <laughs> I must have had three or four people in this exhibit, and we're gonna, I have them all in a row now coming. Said, "Oh, my neighbor Kim said I should learn about the Plastic Club and I should enter." So, 
could our ambassador <laughs> is going to speak about her piece, which is actually connected to another piece um, by that male figure in there. So it has a lot of very strong composition parts in there. I like that the wood slats that have a triangular um, yellow um, section and a gray yellow section. That roof has these strong diagonals and with in parallelograms, you have a, a lot of other rectangles intersected by diagonals when we get to where that stone wall is. When you get this, it's very interesting because then we have a cutout strata of more back to a, a strong foreground by having that, I guess it's a chicken. <laughs> Um, walking there. So she has a lot of interest in there. The puzzling part for me always was that, what's that blue? <laughs> she's, she's told me what that blue was, but your eye sort of goes into that blue spot and it is a puzzle. Um, but anyway, so can you tell us about um, what elements you added as a collage and, um, and what, who that fellow is and what else was your inspiration for this? I'll be, I'll be happy to do that, Roberta. I don't know if you have the original photograph that I took that would show the extent to which I actually altered, you know, the actual reality. But uh, I, I did have it. You know, I did forward it. I'm sorry. Um, uh, this is an extremely, extremely altered piece. It is. It is. <laughs> it is hugely altered. So I'll just, I'll just mention one thing, Roberta. One thing you and I can agree on: this is not Martha's Vineyard, and I think. <laughs> Everybody would agree with that. Uh, but, no, they uh, old farms. but you know what? Everything about this is altered. The only thing that things that aren't altered is the name of the little village. It's called Summersville, which I find very American, sort of like Splitsville and Bonneville. And <laughs> so that isn't, that's real. And the shack is actually very real. And since I took the shot only about a month ago, it's even more dilapidated than it appears. Every time I go by there, it's falling apart even more. But the other elements were all collaged in the sky, the grass. Uh, I try to, as you say, work off the angles. I try to work, I try to have sort of blocks of color. And I was inspired by an artist that I've been telling my Zoom, Bob Moore Zoom art chair about, a guy called Franco Fontana. But then if you actually look back to some of Hockney's early work in California, he has these big blocks of clear blue skies and greens and things like that. So that was my inspiration. But, but let me tell you about the people in there. The person in there is a gentleman called Christopher Hauser, who is actually my neighbor. And uh, Roberta will be telling you something more about his daughter, Brianna, very soon, I hope. Um, so it wasn't taken in the shack, it was actually collaged in. The flag is emblematic of the entire area around here. Everybody has a flag on their homes. I don't know whether it's because of the pandemic or whether it's because I just never noticed before because I was always in and out and traveling, but everyone has a flag. So I actually added the flag. And a couple of other things I added was the chicken. And uh, Christopher's daughter and I were walking around outside his house in this dirt road, and we saw a whole herd of chickens or a flock of chickens that were walking. And so I took the shot and put it in the, in the, in the collage. And the last thing uh, are those beer cans. One of the favored brews around here, if not the most favored brew, is not a Negroni. It is a bush, bush beer. <laughs> And uh, this is actually corn bush beer. I'm not aware that Chris drinks beer or that he drinks bush, but I'll ask him after this is over. But as I say, the whole thing is entirely collage. The sky didn't look like that. The grass didn't look like that. All those <laughs> things weren't there. The only thing that was there was the shack and the, the name. So that's it, Roberta. I mean, I like the stories behind each of the elements. They certainly were very personal to you, and um, thank you. The next one is one, she's not going to be here, Amy Hizeo, Peaceful Late Afternoon. Um, but 
Amy she, Shaw. Huh? Amy she, how do you pronounce it? Amy Shaw. You don't pronounce the N. Okay. So she, she was a referral from Kim and it's, it's just a very lovely landscape. I mean, I like those, this strata of the blues that she has a triangle in there. She has different shades of um, dark blues and they're not the same. Then she goes into her light areas and you have, you know, this hint of uh, wind or something by these lines. It's just a very lovely, lovely peak peaceful late afternoon, though it does seem like it might threaten rain. <laughs> but um, I'm glad that you referred her and I hope she can join us next time. I think she's working today. Um, the next one was a big surprise to me. Bree Hauser, um, Binghampton Arcade. So this was one of the first pieces that I had um, put down on my list. And do we have Bree up there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, you're here. So I didn't know she was a 14 year older. <laughs> I'm 15. 15? <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, yeah. see, you're getting older, but. <laughs> so this, she is quite, quite talented. She just, I mean, I looked at this, I said, well, really kept this energy of the game room with these fluorescent colors and these um, active movements with these fluorescent. Um, uh, wires or shapes, whatever they are, tubes, and the use of the perspective that zooms you back to the um, background with the oranges and yellows. It's just in the rug, if it's a rug, it has these diagonal elements that also zooms you back. I mean, you just have this sense of, boy, this is a vibrant place. This is a place to be. And the, the eye wanders all around in this place. So you really got this sense of an arcade. So I was wondering if she had done a series on arcades, you know, thinking this is a adult <laughs> photographer who's been doing lots of different work and lots of different series. And so go ahead, Brianna, tell us about yourself and tell us about um, this piece. <laughs> well, um, I'm, Kim referred me actually, but um, like you said, I'm 15 and um, this is one of my favorite <laughs> places to go to. Actually, it's called Skate Estate. Uh, it's in... Binghamton, New York, uh, very close to me actually. And I actually didn't mean to capture it in the way that I did. I was just taking a simple picture for my friends on Snapchat. And I was just going, I got home that night and I looked at it and I was just like, this has potential. So I went to my editing app. I usually use Instagram or the other app, it's called Visco. And I just kind of edited it and enhanced the colors and it kind of just turned out like this. And I thought I'd enter it because it was, it's my favorite place to go to. So that's kind of my local inspiration. It's a wonderful, wonderful piece. You're so talented and um, we hope to see more of your work. I mean, I'm, we'd love to see different um, approaches that you take. Um, it didn't just sort of happen. You, you're, you had to put yourself and your eye and your intuition in it. And you obviously have both a good eye and good intuition. And thank you, Kim, for referring her. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so looking forward to seeing more of your work. And, thank you. Um, and again, more people should be like Kim. She is a great ambassador. I mean, for the last couple of exhibits, I keep having, oh, Kim referred me. My neighbor, Kim referred me. <laughs> she is an ambassador to the Plastic Club. <laughs> so um, Jean Renzi, um, Pastion Fountain. So in the last few, we've, we've seen a number of pieces from Jean and I think they've all been watercolors. So when I saw this piece, I was surprised and said, oh, what a lovely photography um, eye he has. And I wondered if he had just taken this because he was gonna use it for a painting. You know, you have this, this um, architecture that could look sort of hoppers, like hopper with the um, rectangles and the regularity. Um, but as a photographer, he did a really nice job of with the blurred figures sort of um, have this sense of motion as the tree seemed to have. And you had the windows were echoed in the pots and the lovely shadow of the bench. I mean, there's just a lot of strong elements. And the telephone wire created this um, triangle 
with the roof line, usually these um, wires, telephone wires are pesky little um, things that get in the way, but he used it very nicely as part of his composition. So I was to see that Gene um, has a history actually with um, one of our presidents, Rick Wright. So Gene, can you tell us about your photography and your, um, this piece? Let's yeah. see. Yeah, I've been working with Rick for several years at Fleischer and also had worked with Bob Lee in the past too. Um, this is taken with a Rolleiflex twin lens camera, medium format uh, film, and it is a silver print. The image is 10 inches by 10 inches and uh, taken on the tripod using a special R72 filter for the infrared which in plain words, if you look at it, it looks like a burgundy or a cabernet or a wine. That's how dark it is. And it filters out certain light. And when it hits the film, the other light, it changes skies to black, water to black, all foliage becomes green. It was a long exposure once, approximately one second. That's why the, the, the figures are in motion. And there was a vehicle in the background moving. It's at the Pashunk Fountain and right around the corner for where I live. Midday, that's where the shadow is directly under the bench. And um, it just was, it just made me happy when it turned out so well. Well, it sure did. It's a very striking um, photograph and um, so multi-talented because I've loved your watercolor pieces also in the past that we've seen. So thank you for sharing. Thank you very um, much. Carolyn Whitholm, Airfoil Currents in Eddie's Composite. Hi, oh. can you hear me? Wait a minute. I'm sorry, you're right. Tina, you were fine. <laughs> Denise Bronco, Bob and Barbara. So as soon as I saw this piece, I had a laugh when I saw that bird on that man's shoulder as he's busy watering the plants. Um, but besides just the subject matter, which is, I think she has a very strong composition. You can see that um, is framed by the L of the door above him and the hose zigzags up, lead you You have very striking values of that dark plant in the left-hand corner um, and the, uh, contrasting with all the other values. And so you end up having a focus both with the plant and that blue shirt and blue parrot. So, Denise, if you could tell us about this piece. The other thing you can't see on this, but a piece that I had seen um, on the when I first saw it, it wasn't a standalone piece. It looked like it was a, you know, she has a, um, so I was very surprised this piece that was just looked like Breaking it was part up. of a journal that she keeps. And, and is, the, is the parrot Barbara? Yes. Your Can neighbor. you hear me? I know. I'm still seeing Jean. Hello? Uh, yeah, we can hear you, Denise. Oh, good. Well, now my, my painting is gone. Whoops. We can hear you, Denise. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Barbara, Barbara's a 35 year old bird. And Bob is that gentleman. Around three properties have this greenery, and he has um, this, uh, I guess it's a, sort of like an aquarium kind of thing with a turtle and koi. And I see it all the time when I pass it, and I always get a wonderful feeling while I'm passing it. And um, this particular morning, he happened to be out. So I turned around and snapped the picture. And uh, then asked him, and then he posed, and I didn't like any of the posed pictures, but the original ones, what I went with, um, and I tried to capture just the unity of it, just 
all his plants, his animals. He also has a dog. Um, the, the guy is extraordinary. And from what I understand, he's a very nice gentleman. I didn't know his name until I decided to do the painting and ask him. But um, it, it, it's a very nice area to pass by on 10th Street when I walk early morning with no traffic and no people. So is this part of a composition um, notebook that you keep on various um, scenes that you are just um, yes. painting and they're not, it's just like a journal or something? Yeah, everything, um, any, anything that moves me in the area, of course, it's everything I see that's around me. Uh, something that I, I use art to express. So something that makes me feel something um, is tending what I wanna do. This particular piece, I just got rid of all the background noise and because I wanted Bob, Barbara, and the plants. Uh, I just used the rails for perspective. But other than that, um, it was just my subject matter that I wanted to show. And the other thing that I've been playing with lately is that dark area that we refer to as black paper that's glued on white paper and then painted on mm -hmm. because I found that oh. I can get depth when it comes to plants. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So it's a collage. No, just that black. Uh, I wouldn't call uh, it. Uh, yeah, just two, that. Two different so sides. Patch. The very, the very lower left is where it stops. Right. That's actually white paper. That's actually the actual paper. But if you look, you can make out the lines where it's really dark. That's a, right. that's a piece of black paper. Ah, and you did get depth from that. It so. really does because you. Otherwise, it would look like the very top. And I wanted it to look like it was coming at you because these were really big leaves. So thank you and thank your neighbor <laughs> for, letting us, for letting you take the picture. Um, our next piece is a really very puzzling piece. Um, and I have questions even after she gave me her answer. So Carolyn, with, Carolyn Witt's home, air foil currents and eddies composite. Um, Let's see, Carolyn, are you here? I see her. I heard a mic, so it sounds. Can you hear me now? Carolyn? Yep, can you hear me? I can't see or hear her. Caroline, we can barely hear you. Uh, can, can you speak up, Caroline? Get... Sure, can you hear me now? Is that better? Not too well. Um, Okay, I'll see if I can figure out how to make it louder. Does she do can you hear me better now? Closer to the computer. I'm that's that's I'm a little sure. better. Is that better there? That's yes. Okay. So how can I, first of all, thank you very much. It's really um, wonderful to be able to speak about this piece with you. So what kind of questions can I answer? Well, I was, um, just puzzled by this combination of, of um, materials, this text, the weaving, and um, I couldn't tell, well, you, you told me, and I still have questions. Do you have a connection with the Franklin Institute? No, no, I don't Are, have any, any connection with them at all, other than um, my mother, oh. my mother um, always took my siblings and I to the Franklin Institute because she always felt it was such an important place. And um, okay. Okay. so, so I, I, I don't have any- why I asked for that. Oh, the reason I'm asking is that the pieces in here have a connection to the Franklin Institute. And I was sort of really um, very interested in that. So could you tell us about, there's a text piece in there, then, um, on the bottom, there's a looks like a woven white piece, and then above, um, you explained to me that that's actually a loom. And so, can you tell us about these three different components and why you put them together? Sure. Um, basically, I went back to school um, at. I'm a graduate of uh, Philadelphia Textile, which is Jefferson University. And I went back to school, uh, refreshed some of my skills in 2013, and then at the end, uh, uh, 
I took a semester to refresh my skills in, in the jacquard weaving. And then I took the independent study. I had been a professional textile designer uh, for four different textile companies here in the United States. And I wanted to be able to spend that time in the independent study portion, really pulling all of the skills that I had learned from a lot of people who had taught me. And so when I started to do a collection, I, I thought and thought and I said, okay, it has to be something from the Franklin Institute to inspire me because really that's the most important place according to my mom. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think we're losing you. I'm sorry. And so um, I started to go through the museum and I wanted the pieces in the museum to tell me basically, you know, the story that I was, I was going to have a story because I have a, a son and I wanted my son to be able to understand the story of whatever it was going to be because I'd read him so many books. So I had a beginning, middle and an end. And so these two pieces that you see here are just two pieces that are part of my collection. And these pieces are speaking, the portion that I, that spoke to me the most as, as I spent time in several visits trying to figure out what I was gonna talk about and what I was gonna design and, and how I was gonna make it was gonna be wind because wind seemed to come to me. Wind was something that was what my topic was going to be. And so then as I started to research and put my version of what that sort of book would be, these pieces came to me. And I felt that the words that this George Cayley who was a very important scientist they were beautiful words and they sat in this particular book and I, I wanted to bring them out and I wanted to combine them with some of what was talked about at the Franklin, which was these currents and eddies. And so the structure that you see under the words is one designed fabric of a few components to make the design of currents and eddies that you see flowing underneath the words. And the words themselves float above the, the surface of that other design. So it's, it's a special way of weaving on a jacquard loom. And so the words are floating across the top. Um, are the your, words woven? Do, yes, are the woven words in. woven? Or the, yes, oh. what, what's happening on the loom is it's a particular technical way of jacquard weaving mm -hmm. where when you're you're beginning the design underneath and you're stopping it and you're throwing a, a gold thread across the top. That's the very first thread of the bottom of one of the letters. And then you're telling the loom, okay, stop that action and begin the next thread for underneath. So it's a series of commands that you tell the machine what to do. So there's one design on the bottom and one design on the top. And, and did you do that particular weaving? Yes, is that all, of, all of these, all of these are all done by me. Um, technically okay. on the loom, there's a technician, um, an engineer that runs the loom. No one's allowed ever to run a loom on their own because they are, they're, they're very big machines and they're mm -hmm. very complicated. And so they're trained uh, men and women who run the machines. So that particular design is one on the top. So, is, do you want me to explain the one on the bottom now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So another thing that that came while I was walking through was um, the Wright brothers have a book that's sitting at the museum and so many people just seem to kind of pass it by because it, it's really an incredible book and it has all of the numbers that they that they wrote down as they were developing the airfoil as they were making these calculations. And they're little numbers. They're not great big numbers. They're little numbers that I could say to my son, that's a three, find three for me. That's a, a, an eight or seven eighths. They were all numbers that, that really anybody could, could understand when they're young. And I was so surprised to see how they were small numbers and they were all in this book, but it's because of the way they were using their test, developing their test. And it was the 12th collection of these numbers. It wasn't their first attempt, it was the 12th. 
before they were able to generate all of these numbers and really come to find how that airfoil was working and help the, the whole aviation industry. So these two pieces are just part of what I was trying to show how textile designers can interpret things maybe to help people see something, see something scientific that they hadn't thought about before or to be helpful in the science field in some way. Wow, this is a very sophisticated piece. Um, your explanation was very, very helpful. It was, um, I wasn't sure whether those, you had done all that weaving. And I think your last comment is very telling actually, is by again, embodying something in art you lift it out of the context where people look at it as the everyday, as the usual, and don't really see it. And by putting it particularly in such a unusual format, I mean, how many people would be putting words like this in a um, very difficult um, weaving? You have certainly taken it and made it more extraordinary. And thank you very much for submitting this and taking the time to explain it because it was a complicated explanation. <laughs> thank you. Um, no, thank you so and I much appreciate... for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Now, can I ask a question? And we hope to see you next time. Um, you know, because you obviously are one who breaks boundaries and breaks rules. So um, we'll see you in the next exhibit, I hope. <laughs> thank you very um, much. May, may I ask a question? Well, the next Sure. Sure. Uh, Go you ahead. mentioned a book, um, and and I, I wasn't I wasn't actually getting the connection. Is is this is this destined for a book, or are you creating a book of these with these weavings? No, it was just something that when when you're designing and when you're creating, you have to have a purpose when you're when you're going to do this. So my 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 purpose was to help people in my industry. And that that's my first and foremost purpose. And the second was, you know, that my industry with science. And so for me, having read so many children's books to my son, it was, it was a much uh, clearer path if I thought of my project as a book. And how would I write a book if I were going to be weaving the wind? And so how would I begin? How would, how would my book go to the middle? And then what would the end of my book be? And so these pieces are just two of the, the story of what I wove with, with my collection. And, and how many pieces are there all, all together? Uh, probably about at least 50, as well as um, my, my weaves, my diagrams, my pictures, my, there's a, probably wow. a, about 50. And, and where can we see these? Here, <laughs> that's it. No, I and mean, seriously, photographs? I don't, I don't, this is the, I, you know, this is, you're the, you're really open to see these two pieces. And I thank you because it's, it's helpful for people in my industry. So thank you. Do you have photographs of all those? Of all of the other fabrics? Some of them. Well, maybe um, we can talk um, offline later about sharing. I think people would be interested in this. And did you ever share these then back with the Franklin Institute so they knew um, how you were actually recognizing their importance in their collections? Do they know I, about I, your-, your I, mentioned, I mentioned it once and I was very kindly directed to a particular person, but there really wasn't. I've, I've sent them lots of different places just simply because I was, again, trying to show a way that weaving people in the weaving industry, people who design these machines and you know make these fabrics and who study all of this, maybe they could be helpful to help other, other scientists, other doctors, other people looking for clues. And so it, when your opportunity came up, I said, oh, all right, I'll try this and put it in and see if, you know, I'll just put it in That's because great. it was from you. So thank you for the opportunity. And you know your 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 tale about the Franklin um, Institute and their um, history and the machines makes me think about Alan Playwan's um, discussion about Pasiank and and the factories. I mean, we have these bygone eras that thank goodness we have artists capturing them. Um, 
probably in a, a little different light than people who had to experience them, but it still is a very interesting um, take on an earlier time. So, but we'll talk offline about um, maybe sharing your materials because it certainly is very different and very interesting and very intriguing. Thank you, thank you very much. So um, Jane Wilkie, um, welcome to Philadelphia. Hello. So, Jane, so are you yes, there, I'm Jane? Yes, I'm Because uh, I'm right now in a different view. So um, as soon as you see Jane's piece, you go, oh, that's a fun piece. I mean, we obviously see a, a, a conic bridge as a Philadelphia scene, but those people are hilarious. You know, you have that lady, um, with her bright pants and her bright yellow shirt. You have those guys without their shirts, with their tummies sticking out <laughs> very proudly. You have the guy in back with his uh, probably beer, um, you know, looking like Rocky. And it's just a fun piece. And then you look closer and you say, wow, this piece actually has very, very strong compositional elements. You have that strong triangle in the foreground you have that brick wall that goes from light to dark. That's also on a diagonal. You have the water level, which is on a also a different shades of blue, and it's also on a slight diagonal. And then you have the background that's broken up by the activity of the, the bridge. Um, so even though there's a lot going on, there's a sense of stability in this because you have that anchor of the bridge column and you have the people standing up right vertically. So um, Jane had a very interesting story that goes behind the creation of this. It actually started 30 or 40 years ago to come through here. So Jane, could you tell us about this um, painting and its origin? Sure. Um, I worked from one photo to create this. Um, it was taken by my husband, Peter. Um, he, like Roberta said, about 30 or 40 years ago, um, Peter was in his photographer years and he would always carry his camera around Philadelphia looking to snap the perfect shot for a postcard. Um, and so, and he normally took photos of landmarks and if there were any people in them, they were unrecognizable. But on this summer day, the partiers said, take our picture. And <laughs> um, the, the resulting composition was spontaneous. Um, I often look um, at the many photos we have around the house taken by Peter or myself um, for inspiration. So that's how, that's how this one came to be. And you made an interesting remark about how the, the people are lined up because when you ask people to pose, that's what they do. They line up. <laughs> right. So, Roberta asked if I, if I choose that lineup stance and not necessarily, but like she said, that's, that means take our picture. Right. Right. So I thought that was funny. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us then how this photograph started developing and we have additional, um, slides that we're going to show, courtesy of Susan Plogue, who had done a PowerPoint. Jane participates in the Tuesday night um, Zoom share um, that Bob Moore sponsors. And this was a very helpful process to her for developing um, the painting by getting the feedback from her peers, which is also why I had mentioned Stephanie might really enjoy doing that and other people might. So Tina, can you show the, um, how it, it developed? And then Jane, if you could address that. Sure. You have the. Yeah, Bob, I'm sorry, Bob, I had technical difficulties, so Bob's doing a slideshow. Um, but before okay. we go to the next slide. <laughs> I hope we can. It's, um, 20, it's like 26 through 29. Yeah. So what this was initial, why don't you just talk about it, Jane? Yeah, so You'll this was the, this was the first um, image that I shared with the group. And what I did was um, I was looking at the photograph and, and sketching with burnt umber. I wanted to sketch the lights and the darks um, to start off the, the painting. So that was the first piece. And uh, it was kind of fun to 
to know that this this image was going to develop further, but the the other participants would get to go along for the ride. So <laughs> this was the first one. Okay. And then I added. Um, I, I chose blue and a darker color, like um, reddish brown, and just use those colors to make a different values all around. Um, there, there had been a lot of objects in the foreground. There were cases of beer and beer cans and another person's foot, but I, um, like Denise Bronco said, I got rid of that background noise. I wanted to focus on the mm -hmm. figures. So take note of, okay, so the bridge was darker. Then this is the third piece we have. I lightened the bridge to put it more in the background mm -hmm. and um, put in the colors. Um, if, yeah, you'll see there, there's more colors, but the, the central figure's pants, you will take note, never changed. Um, they were actually really dark black and I sketched them in, but then I thought that the initial sketching with the dark blue looked like, sort of looked like a print, so I, I kept it. Then, um, so here's where I added more colors and I was going to continue to add more detail to the woman's pants, but Susan Plug made a comment in the sharing and she said, oh, I like the pants. So I thought, okay, well, <laughs> I, it, that says flowered pants, good enough. And- It uh, does say flowered pants. <laughs> yeah. It does. <laughs> yes. And so then um, this is the final image. Um, you can't really tell, but uh, in the lower left-hand corner, I had put a streak of red just for some for some it. visual interest down there and, and then I what had originally drawn me one of the things had drawn me to this photograph was the orangey red skin tones and so at the very end I I added more red to the skin tones and because that red is picked up in her pants and in the red solo cups I think that kind of brings the eye around mm -hmm. the composition. So and what's also nice is that, you know, you made sure that the skin tones, though they may have had some reds in them, they were all different. And so it keeps an interest in mm -hmm. um, the people. You treated them like individuals. <laughs> yes. um, so those, those red cups, are, are those those like plastic red Dixie cups? They, they they are, I made them look like the red solo cups. They really were not in the photograph. Oh, well, why the change? Because I think a red solo cup is such an iconic image. And, and it does keep your eye moving. Yeah, and I wanted it to pick up the red in her pants and her flip flops and. Well, funny story. Apparently when college students in Europe have um, America themed drinking parties, yeah, those those red solo cups are a requirement. That, okay, that's what makes it an exactly. American party. So, um, I know that we're at three o'clock now, but if people wouldn't mind staying um, another ten minutes, I think that we can get through. Um, we have some other really nice pieces. I mean, if people, you know, don't forget the um, that we have those ex exhibitions coming up. And don't forget the Tuesday Zoom share. Um, but I would like to just continue with, um, I think the next one is Elkie Muller, South Philadelphia Door. Thanks, Jane. Sure, thank you. So, Elkie, are you here? It, did she register? Uh, I, she was here earlier, but I think she's gone, so. Uh, she's not she's not here anymore okay well all right so one i'll just quickly just say then what i liked about this photograph was that it seemed so painterly it looked like there was splatter on the wall it just seemed like a almost like a painting um or a charcoal drawing and part and so the value contrast in the painterliness is what drew my eye to it 
So um, David Horowitz, Bethany Beach, that should be 31. Yeah. Um... So John's heads are always intriguing because they don't, they usually look very narrative. There's always seems like there's an inner life to what he is painting. And he called this Bethany Beach, though it had an earlier name, Zelda. So if no. you can tell us about this story uh, of Zelda and Bethany Beach. Thank you. Actually, the name was Nelda uh, with an N, Zelda with an N. But what was it? Zelda okay. with an N, as in Nelda, ah. N-E-L-D-A. Nelda. Oh, okay. Not Zelda. <laughs> Nelda. So I originally painted this. Okay, I misread it. No, that's fine. I originally, um, I originally painted this um, and called it Nelda because it's my wife and it was a vacation we did at Bethany Beach um, when the kids were growing up. We used to go to Bethany Beach every year and um, we didn't own a house but we would rent. And when you rent a house, you typically do so in the spring and you never really know what the weather's going to be like. It's sort of a gamble when you get down there in the summer. And one summer we went down and it rained just about every night, every day. And that's always a little bit difficult when you have kids, what to do, and you can't get out. And, you know, so it's frustrating for everyone, you know. You take a week off from work and, it, you know, it's, it rains the whole week. So it can be kind of trying the week as far as these things go. And um, that this particular week it rained pretty much every day. And the last day we, um, we, um, it stopped raining and we, before we drove off, you know, you leave Saturday morning typically, we went down to the beach and even though it wasn't raining, um, it was, we didn't actually go to the beach, we went to the parking lot near the beach. It was very, very overcast. And I took a photograph and it's a color photograph, but the, it actually looks like a black and white photograph because it was so um, overcast. And uh, it just wanted to paint a painting of it. And, um, I think the picture, the, you know, my wife, I think she, I think she was tired by the end of the week, you know, and kind of worn out and, and, um, you know, she actually handles these things better than me, but, um, you know, in terms of dealing with, you know, when the kids were young, dealing with them and stuff, um, be more. You whatever. definitely captured the fatigue. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's kind of, you know, it's a not, being there for that week of rain and, you know, anyone who's ever been through that kind of knows, I think maybe what I'm talking about and. That was the inspiration for this uh, painting. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And I think we've all had the painting. So 32 is Bonnie McAllister, our lady of neighborhoods. Um, we've seen, um, we've seen Bonnie's Bonnie. previous submissions who she's, amazing with her hair. I've always loved the hair on her figures, but I also like that fluorescent um, business above the hair, as well as the choker um, that was wearing. And the fluorescent above the hair sort of gave her like this Our Lady of Neighborhoods. It's sort of like, okay, she's um, a special, maybe like a saint, but you look at that eye and it's a little bit jaunty. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so could you tell us about the materials? It's, there's obviously a lot of different materials in this um, work. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's nice that there are a bunch of other um, textile and fiber artists in the show as well. Um, and some of these fabrics made me think of uh, the jacquard because they are found fabrics. Um, they were rescued from a trafficked community um, in India. We took the fabrics and we turned them into rag dolls. And one of the shows of the rag dolls a few years ago was actually at the plastic club. So um, it was important to me to incorporate, you know, some materials that hadn't been used in the plastic club show um, years ago uh, in this piece. Um, so I collect fabrics also just like I collect um, uh, fibers on my travels. And then a lot of my recent travels have been in Norway, Iceland, Sweden, Britannia, and then um, before that, Ethiopia. So I actually learned how to spin and how to uh, weave and how to do textiles while I was in Ethiopia on my Fulbright. 
And um, this young woman reminds me not only of some of um, the folks I knew in Ethiopia, but um, she could be any one of my neighbors also. Um, I live, you know, in University City. Um, we call it West Powelton. And um, so the fabric underneath is felt that I made uh, the, by um, doing a wet felting process where you layer the fibers back and forth like a basket weave almost. And it's sort of like making paper. The hair is done um, through that a wet felting process of um, it's wool from sheep. This sheep is from Shetland. And um, because of the natural growth um, on the sheep when it's shorn, you get different colors. I didn't add any additional dyes to the colors of, on the hair. Um, and I let the, you know, the natural fibers um, guide me as I was needle felting them onto the felt. It's also needle and wet felted, um, dot, hand dyed, and um, there's also some uh, alpaca seconds in the white, which is next to her hair. And um, so the, it's a lot of different textiles together. And um, that makes me think of a neighborhood because we are all a pattern of text of, of folks together. And um, she's just one representation of the neighborhood. I mean, you certainly, in this brief explanation, have conveyed the complexity of the work that you do um, and really appreciate you sharing it. Um, and I enjoy seeing your different entries and, and hearing about it because each time I get to appreciate a little bit more of the artistry and the technical skills that go into this and the patience. So thank you for sharing that. Um, thank you, I'm not sure he, um, there, John Atanasio, Reflections. So I'm not sure he's here. Oops, wait a minute, 31, 32. I'm, I'm sorry. Here. Yeah, I'm here. John, okay, good. So this painting, um, you know, I looked at it and I thought, wow, Hopper. <laughs> it's, but, oh. you know, um, but made more original. It just had this, um, th it was because of the geometry of the composition. It was such a striking work and I just loved the underpinning abstraction. Um, if you go through it, you just have these diagonals, you have these parallelograms, you have rectangles, you have this perspective that goes in. Um, your eye just keeps looking at this very, very, and very strong painting. Of, and then you look at this thing that I thought was also intriguing is you have the Walker reflections in the window. And I thought, you know, just really very sophisticated um, painting. And he has, I liked how he did the reflections in the glass, like with calligraphy. Um, just a really, really fabulous, strong painting. Can, can you tell us about it? Well, thank you. Um, well, it's um, the result of a walk in the city, which I often do, um, which is why I like the theme of city, city sidewalks and, um, and center city, especially. Um, I was, I've always been drawn to, in terms of the, the, the perspective, I think back, I somehow, I saw a um, new trio when I was maybe 10 years old or in that range of age, and thinking that Maurice Utrio had this deep, his, his paintings of Paris street scenes was always with deep perspective, which I, I don't know why I've been drawn to it. I like the depth, I like the creation of a, the 3D effect. Um, so I look for things like this. So I was just on a walk with my camera, just my iPhone actually, looking for um, light and shadow, especially um, this activity on the street, some simplicity. This scene when I uh, took the photograph had very few people in it. It's pretty much what you see here. Uh, and I realized I could make something of this uh, by reducing other clutter that was there uh, and sharpening some of the contrasts where I wanted them and creating that depth. 
Um, and I think there was a, a level of activity too created by the, the play of the light on the sidewalk, the reflection on the glass, the construction signs in the distant background that you can see them on fluorescent orange. It's not really fluorescent, it's just orange. Um, so that's what I, I painted. And I painted it, I believe I painted it on a, I don't have it with me, but it's, um, I think it's not on canvas, it's on a, um, a board. So I was able to get higher resolution, I guess, a little more sharpness. Um, and um, it's fairly monochromatic, really. And I liked that aspect of it. So um, that's my explanation. It's, it's excellent. I mean, it's just quite fabulous. I asked him, we used your um, photography. Have we shown you photography or is it earlier exhibit, in earlier salons? Pardon me? I don't. Have, I can't hear you. I've, I know I, I've shown your work before. We, we've um, talked about your work in earlier salons. Was the photographs that we talked about? No. Yeah, so aren't you lucky to be so talented? Uh, the other um, painting was from a model um, that I painted, and I, it, was the, it was the Hopper-esque um, painting with the model looking out oh, yeah. the window. Um, no, that was not a okay. photograph at all. I oh, often use photographs okay. because rather than sketch, it's just I can capture it quickly, and then I work from that. I, you know, I feel that I can enhance or change the photographic aspect of it to some extent. And now, this is, uh, I mean, I love this painting. I love the shadows. I love the reflections. I mean, just yeah. really a bravo, a bravo job. Seven, uh, thank you. Um, go ahead. I think is that, that 17th, you had a question. John? It is 17. It's 17th and Sansom. Right. Okay. Yeah, I recognized it. Very nice. Thank you. So the, the last person is not going to be here, so we could just look at his picture and then um, I'll just thank everybody for being here. Neil Johnson. It just was such a, a striking um, picture. He just, um, you know, he just felt that this was um, talking about the new order that might come. And we don't know what it is, who's going to be head. <laughs> anyway, I. I didn't, he didn't explain about his um, title, um, but it was such an interesting photograph that I wanted to share it anyway. And it's one to be looked at and kept looking at. So thank you all for coming. Um, be sure if you're not already on the mailing list to go on the mailing list. 